Hello, my name is Hiram Russell uh, in Physics 106. I'm going to be talking about the Pauli Exclusion Principle today. So the Pauli Exclusion Principle states that no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. Now, uh, this is very useful when we look at the periodic table of elements because each element, at least in its stable form, will have a different number of electrons. And to determine where those electrons are within that element, we can use this principle. And this will be very important to us, be, at least in other subjects, because depending on the amount of electrons and where they are, it will determine how that element reacts with other elements, depending upon like where their electrons are in relation to each other. So we have four different quantum numbers, and this will help explain a certain aspect of like each electron. So the first quantum number is the, the principal quantum number, which is also denoted as n, and, and we know it as the shell. Now, the shell, or the principal quantum number, will increase the farther down the periodic table you go. So at the top where you have hydrogen, you're going to have one, while at the bottom, we're gonna have seven. So the next one is the increment momentum, also known as L or the subshell. Now, this, this quantum number is especially important because this will determine the, like, shape slash orbital in which the electrons reside. And this is very important for determining reactions and how those happen. Now, on the right, we have the periodic table and it is split up into four different sections depending upon the L value. So L equals zero is going to be on the very left. L equals one is going to be on the very right. L equals two is going to be in the middle. And then we have an L equals three, which are those elements that like fit in right there. But since we don't use those elements too much, I'm not going to be referring to them. And you can tell that with each, with each um, like section is that is a certain amount wide. And that is where the magnetic quantum number comes in, some noted as ML. Now this kind of value of negative L to positive L. And this is a very big, like, this helps determine how many electrons can fit into that subshell. And lastly, we have the magnetic spin of that, which can either be negative one half and positive one half. Now, as I said earlier, is that the angular momentum quantum number has a value which has different values, and depending on the, upon those, it'll have a different shape as well. But also, they don't, they aren't listed at by their number. They're actually denoted by different letters. So over here, we have L equals zero, which is an S orbital, a P orbital, and finally an L equals two, which is a D orbital, and they have different shapes. So for the first one, the s orbital, it can hold a maximum of two electrons. And that's because of the ml value that we can now. So we know that, okay, so l equals zero, so that means ml has to be negative zero to positive zero, which means it can only be zero. So two electrons max. Then we have the p orbital. Well, it can be negative one, zero, and positive one. So, and then you have to factor in the magnetic spin. So just multiply it by two. So we have six. Now, we have the orbital here, and this isn't the only one. This this orbital right here does not hold six electrons. In reality, there are two other like orbitals which look like similar to this one. While this one is facing in the y direction. Well, there's gonna be one that faces in the X direction and another one that faces in the Z direction. 
And lastly, for the D orbitals, it can hold a maximum of 10. Now, these ones are not like P orbitals, and not all of the different orbitals look exactly like this. They can have some weird shapes, and I'm not going to go into those since that's not really important to this like principle, to the Pollock student principle. So, as I was talking about earlier with the P orbitals, is so maximum number of electrons in a subshell can be determined by the shell it's in. So we have the shell, which is going to just be itself. L, which is so just going to be n minus one, ml negative l to positive l. The magnetic spin is negative one half to positive one half. So for example, as we just look at uh, for oxygen, for example, we know that it has an n equals two value. So that means L is going to be two minus one, so one. And so since L equals one, then ML is going to be negative one, zero, and positive one. And we have the MS values. So the way that I like to look at that at it is like a branching system. So we're looking for every single different combination of these different values that we can make without having a repeat. So if we just start at the top two, we can go to one, okay, that, that's gonna be the same for all of them. But once we get to the ML values and the MS values, then we have some branching. So let's just start with ML equals negative one. Negative one can then branch off to negative one half, positive one half. And that's all the different combinations that we can get from that particular ML value. And then we repeat it for zero and positive one. So in total, it's going to be six different combinations, meaning six different electrons can be put into a P orbital. So to tell others about the, like how many electrons are in a certain orbital, we have a general form of notation, which is going to be N L with a superscript of the number of electrons in that shell. So n is a number, but L, as I said earlier, instead of being a number, it's going to be the letter, which is going to be S, P, D, or F. And this is mainly to help prevent confusion, because if you have two numbers in a row, then you don't know exactly how, don't know how to like separate them. It's not like very easy. For example, for helium, you're going to have like, it's going to be n equals one and then L equals zero. In the incorrect notation, it's going to look like 10 squared, which, at least when I read it, I see 100 there. That doesn't tell me anything about the electrons in the element helium. Instead, the proper way to say it, or at least write it down, is 1s squared, which means that, okay, it has a principal not quantum number of 1, angular momentum, angular quantum number of s, or at least value of s, which is going to be equal to zero, and you have two electrons in that subshell. So it's going to be full. Now for those heavier elements, so it kind of gets a little more complicated. Not really. It's just a ton more longer because you have to list out all the shells, subshells, and electrons. So instead, they invented a different way that I like to call the noble gas notation, because what you can do is you can eliminate a ton of writing if you instead replace all the like the previous ones with a noble gas, which are located on the right side of the periodic table. So that means all like the numbers and letters that you're going to be writing down are from that row only. So it saves a ton of work. And so for the example, we're going to have sodium, which in extended notation, it's going to be 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p to the 6th, 3s to the 1. Now, if I had to write that down, 
every single time that I wanted to say sodium, that would be a lot of writing. And we can actually save a, a ton of time and space if we just use a noble gas notation, which we know that neon is 1s squared, 2s squared, 2p to the sixth. So to save writing, instead, we replace all of those with ne in brackets, which is just the periodic table like form of neon. So we have the noble gas notation right there, and then anything else that comes after that, we write down. So for example, sodium, well, that one is located in the three S to the one. And so that's a easier way to write down this notation. And in conclusion, um, Pauli exclusion principle is very important for understanding how these different elements react with others and how and like where those electrons are like located in an atom. And so that's all I have. Thank you very much. I'll be seeing you later.